Hello friends, I'm Dr. Sachin Kulkarni. I'm just going to give you a glimpse of just five slides of our total presentation on poor ovarian reserve, just to give you a glimpse of uh, what we are actually discussing and will make you more curious to go through our whole presentation some later time. Uh, I'm going to tell you about diminished ovarian reserve. So let's try and understand three different terminologies. One, diminished ovarian reserve, poor ovarian response, and premature ovarian failure. I would request you all to go through an article by Cohen et al. On this, this requesting plea for a universal definition. And you will definitely agree that we highly depend upon the FSH, anti follicle count, anti malarian hormone are the most important parameters for this. If a lady has four months of amenorrhea, the FSH level is beyond 40 and she has an hypoestrogenic status. Well, that is premature ovarian failure. Bolinia criteria, not universally, but well, they have given some guidance to us to define what is diminished or poor ovarian response. And what is diminished ovarian reserve? Age specific decrease in the ovarian reserve parameters is diminished ovarian reserve. Now, why are we making a crystal clear definitions of these three factors? I again want you to go through an article published in Fertility Sterility by Kate Davin and et al. And this is about September 2015. And this has been an assignment of the SART data published from 2004 to 2011. And they said that diminished ovarian reserve overall increased from 19% in 2004 to 26% in 2011. Well, that means we are detecting large number of our women seeking infertility treatment for IVF to be suffering from diminished ovarian reserve by bolinia criteria or whatever criteria they are using. We definitely expect with this that poor ovarian response should also increase. But that doesn't happen. The incidence of poor ovarian response, unlike the diminished ovarian reserve, actually decreased from 32% in 2004 to 30% in 2011. Now that's something funny. Your diminished ovarian reserve is on a high, but poor ovarian response is on a low. There is no improvement, that means, in the predictive power of the criteria which we use to diagnose the diminished ovarian reserve. And this slide clearly tells that the overall incidence of poor ovarian response decreased, while that of the diminished ovarian reserve increased from 2004 to 2011. What could be the reason? The study says this could be overdiagnosis of diminished ovarian reserve. Increasingly, the women over 40 are seeking infertility treatment when they are achieving the pregnancy successfully, but that is part of DOR. And increased use, or we heavily rely only on the AFC and AMH, being a little more specific though, as the markers of our ovarian reserve. So FSH beyond 12 and age of 40 years and more or combined has the highest prediction of poor ovarian response and the chance of autologous pregnancy then is just 6%. What protocol would you like to use for poor ovarian response? Let me just discuss, there are ample number of protocols, I do agree, but let me just discuss two of them. A low dose menopure and gonalef protocol wherein you are using uh, either 150 or you have Menopure or 150 of gonalef from day 2 to day 9. Uh, sorry, you're not using either of them, you're using combined of them. So, like a conventional protocol, you use a 150 IU menopure plus 150 IU gonalef. Antagonist when the follicle is 12 millimeter, trigger with HCG and lupride. Now, that's something to note. Antagonist when the follicle is 12 millimeter. Another protocol is giving. Uh, Clomiphene citrate 100 mg from day 2 to day 6 and FSH on alternate day that is day 2, 4, 6. Antagonist should be added when the follicle is 12 mm intentionally to avoid a breakthrough bleeding, uh, breakthrough LH rise, not bleeding, LH rise. And because in a poor ovarian responder or a patient with diminished ovarian reserve, at a follicle size of lesser than 14 millimeter, the LH may just escape and go up 
So antagonist needs to be added earlier, unlike most of us prefer adding it at 14 millimeters or later. And even the trigger should be given a little earlier, 16 millimeter, because they notoriously, the follicle may just rupture spontaneously. And which we commonly see in our non-IVF ovulation induction cases, where in this poor ovarian reserve patients, the follicle is 15 millimeter or 16 millimeter on day 9, day 10, and you call her on day 11, the follicle is already ruptured. So these two changes are needed, that early addition of antagonist and early trigger to be given in these two patients. Then again, to improve the pregnancy rate in patients of poor ovarian response, can you change the day of embryo transfer? Sorry, I'm jumping an idea, but I just told you, I'm just giving you a glimpse of different things which we discussed today. There's a study by Shen et al. in 2006, wherein in the study they defined poor ovarian responder as patients who transferred all their embryos. See the definition, transferring all the available embryo as a definition of poor ovarian responder. And it was a retrospective study wherein they said the pregnancy rates were better when day two embryo transfer was done compared to day three. Another study by Bahesi in 2006, this was a prospective RCT, but the definition of poor ovarian responder were less than five follicles on the day of HCG. And in this study, on day two transfer, the pregnancy rate was 27% and day three transfer was 13.6%. So both these studies agree, though the definition of POR is different, agreeing that day two transfer is better than day three. And number of tra embryos transferred on day two could be higher than day three. That's also one of the reasons that Laura Shahin et al. in 2010 published an article in Fertility Sterility. This was a prospective randomized study of 386 women. The mean number of embryos transferred were 2.1 and 2.4 on day 2 and day 3. The ongoing pregnancy rate of day 2 transfers was 12.3% and out of 12, day 3 was 12.7%. So hardly any difference. So limited number of embryos available for transfer is a better criteria to define poor ovarian response than number of mature follicles on the day of HCG. But I'm sure this will raise a lot of curiosities and you have definitely more things to contribute. You would definitely like to discuss all the more protocols using manual stimulation, conventional protocols, doing dual stimulations in different ways, doing back-to-back -back stimulations, embryo pooling, everything about poor ovarian responder. Definitely, you're most welcome to attend the masterclass in reproductive medicine and IVF at Dubai or Bangkok. Thank you.